I don't know if you've noticed, but this is a challenging time for state and local officials. We're having to rapidly embrace a 24-7 digital world in the midst of a pandemic. Luckily, iConstituent.com is on a mission to help digitize services with the first platform designed specifically for the elected official to manage one-to-one personal engagement. See for yourself how their texting outreach tools are making positive impacts during the pandemic, from the city of Los Angeles to the halls of the U.S. Congress. They allow leaders to leverage data sets of constituent phone numbers to share updates on COVID and assist constituents with breaking through the red tape to get the help they need. Visit iConstituent.com to access recent case studies and get started with 5,000 text messages at no cost. Again, that's iConstituent.com. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. I'm proud to say that we're closing in on both our second anniversary and our 50th episode. The New Deal and I are grateful to have shared some amazing leaders with you during that time. From Mayor Pete, when he was just a mayor, to rising stars in the Democratic Party like Senator Ramesh Akberry, Boise Mayor Lauren McLean, and Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. I believe that these leaders deserve a national stage. I hope you will help them, and me, by telling a friend about an honorable profession and rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And guess what? We're now on Instagram. Follow us at hashtag an honorable profession. Hey, everyone. We have an amazing leader for you today. Michigan State Representative Mari Manugian. She's only 28 years old, but in 2018, she flipped a Republican-held seat in the Detroit suburbs and is now a leader in the legislature. She earned her master's degree from the School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. And prior to returning home and running for office, she worked for the Department of State and the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. We talk about her career, why she loves Michigan, and her experience as the first Armenian-American woman to be elected to the State House in Michigan history. This summer, she was selected as one of the 17 emerging leaders in the Democratic Party to speak at the convention. Representative Mari Minugian, welcome to An Honorable Profession. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here. I want to start with just a couple of weeks ago, you were invited to speak to the Democratic National Convention as a rising leader. Um, can you talk about the call that was made to, to have you speak and what that experience was like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, it was just such an honor to be asked to be part of that amazing group of Um, up-and-coming folks in our party um, across different states and um, different identities. It was just really a wonderful opportunity. Um, And when Vice President Biden's team called to ask if that was something I'd be interested in, um, first of all, whenever whenever the vice president's team calls to ask for some help, I'm always game. I know how important the stakes of this election are um, and just really happy to be of any help I could possibly be. And so when that opportunity arose, I was just so um, humbled and thrilled to be part of it. Speaking, when you, when you went to speak, was it, uh, how nervous were you? How strange was it? It's not your normal uh, venue uh, these days in a COVID environment. Tell us what that was like. Sure. Um, so, you know, we found out that it was going to be a crew of about 17 of us giving the keynote address. Um, I first hadn't really, um, wasn't really sure what it would look like. Um, and we, you know, were able to access the script and was just really excited about, um, you know, the opportunity to highlight our district. And so, uh, truthfully, I didn't really, I I didn't really hit me just how amazing and, um, what a big opportunity it was until, um, you know, the day that we announced it to the public that the keynote address was going to look the way that it was, that it looked. And, um, you know, I, because you're so used to Zooming, I'm on conference calls and Zooms constantly as all of us are. And so, you know, we filmed it all remotely. Um, it was, you know, a setup in my condo, um, sort of in my living space. And we created this sort of set that I could give the address from. And, 
Uh, we piped in a director and I uh, had, you know, a director and, and folks who were helping with um, the technology over uh, Google Hangouts. And so it was kind of a strange way to film something, um, although I've gotten quite used to doing that and have done several other videos that way as well now. And so it was sort of a strange experience only because sort of the pomp and circumstance of the convention couldn't really exist in my living space. Um, but, you know, once we saw it come together, um, it was just such an amazing, I, like, I really wasn't sure how it would come together. And then once it was all uh, produced, it looked wonderful. And with such, um, it just was so impactful. And tell me about the reaction you've gotten, both for the cohort of young leaders, but also as an individual, I know um, you're uh, young and uh in fresh to politics. Have you gotten any reaction from people who sort of saw themselves in you? Yeah. So it's actually really, that's a really great question because I've sort of seen it a couple of different ways. So um, first of all, I was the um, only Armenian American to have um, that big of a platform at the convention. Um, uh, state uh, representative and speaker of the house in Maine, Sarah Gideon is half Armenian. And so she uh, was also featured, but, um, you know, having this big of a platform for my um, ethnic community was a really big deal. Um, it's pretty rare um, to have that kind of opportunity within the Armenian community because we are such a small, tight-knit ethnic community. And so um, I got a ton of messages from Armenians around the country who, frankly, had never heard of me before because I'm a state representative. And so if you're not from Michigan or you're not plugged into politics, you might not have heard of me before. And so, uh, young, there was a tweet that I got right before the convention on um, Monday night from a little girl in New York who was like cheering for me because she couldn't stay up past her bedtime. And so that was so sweet. And, you know, of course, just hearing from young folks in my district who were excited to see their representative on TV. Um, and my dad is like my biggest champion. So he delivers yard signs throughout our district. And of course, we're gearing up for re-election. So the signs are all going back out again. And you know, he constantly is calling me saying like, you know, the people here love you, Mari, because they keep saying like, oh, we see her, you know, we see her on TV fighting for us. And, you know, we see how she elevated Birmingham. We see how she elevated our small businesses. Um, and so for them, it's like, you know, the more they see that we're able to do that, the better, um, the better advocate I can be for our community. That's amazing. Yeah, I saw the I saw the tweet from the little girl and uh, it was it was inspiring to see to see a new generation be inspired uh, by politics in these in these difficult times. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, background and specifically uh, your how your Armenian heritage has informed your politics um, and yeah. and sort of your path into public service? Sure. Um, so it's a it's sort of a complicated question, but really um, a lot of it comes down to the conversations my family and I had at the kitchen table over dinner, um, which is pretty common, I think, for a lot of American families um, and sort of how that informs um, their upbringing and really informs their view of the world. So um, my mom um, is a vocational rehab counselor and my dad is retired, but used to be um, a labor leader here locally in Detroit and then um, rose up the ranks and became the chief of staff for the National Utility Workers Union. So I've been around conversations about public service and politics pretty much my entire life. Um, wasn't sure that I would ever run for office myself, but um, really was passionate about public service and um, of course, both my parents are Armenian. And so um, what was really important to them when I was growing up as a kid, it was really important to them to make sure that my younger sister and I grew up in the Armenian community here in Metro Detroit. And so that sort of meant um, attending um, Sunday school. We are Armenian um, apostolic. And so that's a special, that's a different um, sect of orthodoxy from like Russian Orthodoxy or um, Greek Orthodoxy. So we attended Armenian church and our services in our, are in Armenian. So because we didn't grow up speaking the language, they thought it was really important for us to go to Armenian school after school on Monday evenings, which much to our chagrin, we attended pretty regularly. Um, but it was really important to them for us to have that instilled in us um, and to understand our culture and where we came from. Of course, 
um, learning the history of our people, understanding um, the Armenian genocide and the impact that that's had on the diaspora um, and uh, Armenians worldwide um, has really, of course, informed me and um, has sort of guided me on my career path. Um, prior to being elected to the legislature here in Michigan, I uh, worked at the United States Department of State. And um, my experience with, you know, as a kid growing up and learning a language that, although is part of my culture, was a foreign language to me, um, really excited me and got me really interested in learning other languages and learning about other cultures. And so um, that really led me on my career path to studying international affairs. And um, you know, had previously worked um, in Samantha Power's office at the United States Mission to the United Nations. My first job in politics was for the late uh, dean of the house, John Dingell, who is like a legendary congressman here in Michigan. Um, and so, you know, all of those experiences at the kitchen table really led me on this path to where I am now. Can you talk about that shift? I mean, it was striking to me that you were working for the Department of State uh, and the Mission to the United Nations. And then the switch from international politics to domestic politics, uh, the issues are so different, the constituencies are different. Can you talk to a little bit about how you made that shift and what it was like? Yeah, a lot of people kind of thought that it was sort of an unnatural move from going on from the federal level, specifically um, the executive branch at the federal level to something um, like a state legislature. And um, I'll be honest with you, I think the move was way more, um, it, those two things made a whole lot more sense and have a lot more in common than people think. Um, and so, you know, the way that I explain it is I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the Elliott School of International Affairs at GW, where um, I didn't just learn about the culture or politics of a particular location, but learned a lot of skills that will serve me well. Um, and the Elliott School prepares its students to do pretty much anything they wish to do um, with regard to working with other people. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that I did at the State Department, whether it was in Ambassador Power's office, which, you know, I was just an intern and, you know, really learning the ropes of what um, a career in international affairs was like at the time, to my two full-time positions I held at the State Department, a lot of what I did was basically bridge uh, divides between folks who may not otherwise agree with one another on a great many issues, um, but could come together to solve a challenge. Um, and a lot of, again, what we do at the State Department, um, you know, what our federal government does at the State Department is puts aside politics uh, for the good of the people and works to, you know, achieve really important policy outcomes. And so when I spoke to voters in my district about the experiences I had at the federal level, those were all things that they really were hungry for. Again, you know, I ran for office for the first time in 2018. And so, you know, we had already experienced um, two full years of President Trump and um, voters in my district were just really unhappy with sort of the divisiveness and really were hungry for someone who could bring them together. And the skills and experiences I had, um, although they may seem far removed from the work of, this, of the legislature, actually have been really helpful to me. Yeah, and I always think uh, I, I too have a master's in international relations, and I so much of international politics still is driven by domestic politics um, and by the needs of elected officials or, or officials in other countries um, to satisfy their domestic politics. And having that understanding, I think, will make you. It's, it's clearly made you a better domestic politician. I also think, if you so choose to return to international politics, it'll make you uh, a better international uh, politician as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, there's so many opportunities you ha you can um, pursue with um, a degree in international affairs and having that international experience. And one of those things that's been really helpful to me is I serve on the, I serve on two committees, um, actually three committees that this could really be useful for. Um, so I serve on military veterans and homeland security. I also serve on the energy committee and then I serve on the commerce and tourism committee. And because of Michigan's position, um, especially with our Canadian, um, you know, neighbors to the north, um, as well as um, amazing relationships that we have around the world. In particular, um, Michigan has a really strong relationship with um, Israel. You know, a lot of different conversations have been had about sort of how Michigan's auto industry can be positioned as a worldwide um, leader in electric vehicles um, and other um, automotive technology. 
Um, and so, you know, those are conversations that are international trade conversations. And so, um, you know, being able to serve on those three committees really lends me to have those, um, you know, having and having my international affairs background really lends me to have a strong position on those committees. That makes so much sense. Can you talk about the the run for office? So it's 2017, 2018, you're in your mid 20s, you're uh, in a Republican district. How do you go about winning that election and flipping that seat? <laughs> so, um, you know, it was just, it's one of those things that we talk about still at the dinner table. Like, like I said, my, my dad, my mom has lived in Birmingham for um, 33 years. And, um, you know, my dad grew up in an area of Michigan called Down River, which is a, you know, historically working class community um, just outside the city of Detroit. My mother grew up a few towns over from Birmingham in a place called Lathrop Village, uh, which had some of the strictest um, covenant rules um, in the state uh, with regard to who uh, Mrs. Lathrop would sell property and land to. And so uh, they grew up, you know, in a time that was um, a little bit different, but also very similar to what we're going through right now. And so my dad's often like, I can't still can't believe that this district is like not Republican anymore. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot of the work that we did was really just, um, you know, an incredible amount of field organizing. Um, we put together a plan and we worked the plan and um, we knew the district was trending in the direction um, that we thought was favorable to a Democrat. Um, it voted for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election by double digits. Um, and the state representative candidate there lost um, only by a few points. And so we thought that if we could get significant investment and, um, you know, significant, uh, you know, a significant look at this district in a way that was meaningful, um, you know, we would be able to flip it. And so we had a really competitive primary and then a, a competitive general election as well and um, was able to win my primary by about uh, – four and a half points. And we were able to do that because of the, you know, really critical focus on ground game. Um, in my primary election, we knocked over 27,000 doors and I knocked on um, about 5,000 of those doors myself. And then um, for the general election, uh, by the end of the general election, we had knocked on over 50,000 doors across the district and I had done 10,000 myself. Um, and we talked about issues that people really cared about and they were cross cutting, right? So investment in public education, uh, Michigan, unfortunately, gave the world Betsy DeVos. <laughs> and so um, she's someone who, you know, when you mention her name, people like all have a visceral reaction to her. It's really incredible. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about investing in public schools. I grew up in the district and as a product of our public schools with a really strong voice and had, you know, teachers of mine as a, as a young person, you could see that being young might be a detraction, but I still have teachers that I, um, you know, I took their classes in high school. And so they were incredible advocates for me on the campaign trail. Um, so we just talked about issues that really mattered to folks and just cut through the noise and um, didn't run a negative campaign at all and just continue to talk about things that mattered to folks. And we were able to flip the district. Um, we swung it uh, nearly 20 points in two years. Wow. So I also got <laughs> elected in a, in my hometown and, uh, you know, had former teachers when I was knocking on their doors. Can you talk a little bit about for the listeners out there who are thinking about getting engaged in politics as sort of, especially in their hometowns, how do you present yourself as somebody who they knew when you were a kid, uh, as now ready to lead the community and to, to address the issues that they care about? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I did when I first um, announced that I was running for state representative was just have like coffees with people um, and reintroduce myself to the community. Um, I moved home from Washington and then a couple months later announced that I was running for state representative. And sometimes that works um, for folks. I'm like really grateful that it worked for me. I know it can be a sort of a challenge to do that, but. Um, because I grew up in my hometown and because of the kind of community that I'm in, um, in my district, uh, we have the number one, we are the number one district in the state of Michigan for bachelor's degrees per capita, actually. Um, and uh, I think the statistic is 
about um, 81% of my constituents um, who are adults have a bachelor's degree or more uh, or higher education than that. And so they understood that, you know, the experience that I had in Washington would lend itself to being a state representative. And that was sort of, you know, it was incumbent on us to present ourselves in that way and present the campaign that way. Um, But really, a lot of it was just reconnecting with folks that um, you know, we, I had stayed in touch with when I was working in Washington and in New York and, um, just continuing to present, you know, what our credible strategy was for winning and why I was the right person for the job. And, you know, people really, um, people really gravitated towards the campaign and it resonated with them. So speaking of winning, uh, suburban districts and swing states are a big focus, um, not only for, the party, but in fact, for the whole world right now, uh, whose who's, who's, you know, lives depend on the outcome of the November election. How's it looking in terms of the presidential race in Michigan and in the suburbs? Uh, and do you have any advice for the party as they, as they, as we head into the last months of the election? Yeah, I mean, I guess my best advice that I would say is don't take a single voter for granted. Um, as a state rep candidate, I, you know, can really attest to how important it is to knock as many doors as possible and to make as many phone calls as possible and um, just to reach out to every voter. And just because they may have a strong um, likelihood of being a Democrat, according to our data, doesn't mean that you can bank on their vote. And especially in Michigan, we learned that lesson in 2016. And um, you know, saw that, you know, with the president winning just by a little over uh, 10,000 votes here in our state and seeing so many people that we thought were, would turn out and vote for us um, stay home, we just really can't take a single vote for granted. And so, um, you know, as a state rep candidate in 2018, and of course, running for re-election now, it's really, really important that we engage our voters and including our base of people um, and making sure that we know that we see them, we hear them, and that we, that we ask for their vote, humbly ask for their vote again. And do you have a sense that people are mobilized and preparing to vote, uh, that the national and and or more targeted messaging is is working and resonating with people? Yeah, I mean, I've been getting anecdotally, I've been getting messages from constituents who said, you know, I'm so excited to vote for you. But, you know, my parents voted for the president in 2016. But I just want to let you know, I know you've been working really closely with the Biden team and wanted to let you know that the vice president's messaging specifically on the um, auto rescue and the work that um, he and President Obama did to save the Michigan auto industry is really resonating with people. So please, please, please have the vice president keep talking about that Um, because it makes a huge difference. But, you know, we're seeing in Michigan that we've already set a record number of absentee ballot requests for the November election. So I know that people are excited to vote. More than 2 million Michiganders have already asked for a ballot, uh, which is crazy. (laughs) And we're really, um, you know, it's really changed the way that we're engaging with voters, uh, because now instead of doing GOTV at the end of October um, and into the first couple of days of November, uh, we have to be running GOTV and persuasion at the same time because some of our voters have ballots already. Yeah, the election, the election, it's already election day. Uh, and right. We, we, better, we better be ready. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's a new, this is a very new thing for us here in Michigan. In 2018, we, pr- we passed Proposal 3, which was one of the proposals on our ballots um, that expanded access to uh, voting by mail. Um, and with that, it sort of changed the way that we're campaigning. So that's my advice um, to anybody who's listening who is running right now that has seen an expansion of vote by mail in their state um, to make sure that you're, you know, really paying close attention to who has their ballots and that you're speaking to them before they cast theirs. And how are you feeling about the Democrats winning a majority uh, in the state legislature where you serve? I am very optimistic about this because we have been seeing, especially this weekend, I was out in um, several districts helping to knock doors for candidates across Michigan, really excited because our candidates, um, as I said before, are taking the ground game really seriously. Um, And, you know, being just four seats down from taking majority, um, we'd love to have five because having a cushion of five, uh, five would be great. Um, you know, we're really, really taking it seriously and making sure we're reaching out to as many voters as possible. Um, really looking forward to um, traveling up north to help my friend Dan O'Neill, who's running for state representative in the Grand Traverse area. 
Um, and so, you know, our caucus is mobilized to help uh, get our get our candidates across the finish line and make sure those who are in um, very purple districts are able to return as well. And can moving from politics to policy, can you talk a little bit about your experience in the legislature? Obviously, it'll be a better experience uh, in the majority <laughs> than in the minority. Uh, but is it what you expected? Uh, what have you focused your time on and how, how's it been overall? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard. People ask that question often about like, is it what you expected it to be? And I'll be honest with you, I had like no real idea of what it was going to be like when there, um, only because I'm the first person in my family to be an elected official. Um, and so, you know, for some families, um, there, you know, there may be others in your family who've already done something like this before, but like for me, it's the first time. So, um, that said, you know, I think, um, I think folks often get elected thinking they're going to introduce some like gigantic sweeping policy change. That's going to be this like big splashy moment. And for me, I've always kind of kept my head down and really, um, you know, obviously if some big opportunity like that were to come along, that'd be incredible. But um, really for me, I've been really focused on, you know, reaching out to our constituents and seeing if there's anything in particular that they, um, you know, if it's a small, even if it's a small tweak, what can be done to make our lives easier and better. And so, you know, a lot of what we focused on are like really niche bill ideas that, um, frankly, constituents have come to us with those ideas. So um, one of the really big policy, I, I think the biggest policy push that we've made and it was a bill, my first bill that was passed was um, to change our distracted driving laws um, to make them safer, to make the roads safer. Um, and right now we've got a really antiquated version of texting and driving uh, legislation on the books and we're looking to expand that so it includes more modern technology because uh, when it was written, it, our uh, legislators didn't conceive of the idea of having a computer in your pocket. Um, but moreover, you know, small things that would make a really big difference in people's lives. Um, we're working on kayak safety legislation because um, a uh, gentleman who was a constituent of ours who actually went to preschool with my sister, um, unfortunately, tragically died in a kayaking accident. And we think that if we can do some research to understand the efficacy of having flags on beaches versus lifeguards on beaches um, and sort of figuring out how we can make the Great Lakes safer for everyone, we can have a, a safer and better state. Um, so these may seem like really small things, but they're incredibly meaningful and can change people's lives. Yeah, and save people's lives. I mean, uh, the, between the distracted driving exactly. and kayaking, uh, you could look at many, many lives saved over the next decade, and probably no one will know that you did it. But, uh, but, but it can be have a tremendous. And that's impact. okay with me. Yeah, <laughs> that's completely okay with me. I don't need to have like people don't need to know that I'm the one that did this. I just want to make you know our state a safer and better place for everyone. And if it means you know doing something that seemingly as small as changing you know a couple of these laws, um, it's something that I think will be hugely impactful and um, really, really important. I, yeah, I totally agree. So what are your goals if, as you get them majority, fingers crossed, knock on wood, um, and hopefully the federal government returns to something close to functioning? What, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what are your goals going forward? Yeah, I mean, the biggest goal that I would have should we take majority um, is to put together something that will um, hopefully resemble a regional transit plan for the Metro Detroit area. Um, it's something that's sort of our white whale of legislative agenda items. Um, we are really um, hamstrung in Metro Detroit by this lack of regional transit. Um, so many other major cities around the country have access to um, just, you know, a a more robust transit system than Detroit and the surrounding areas do. And that's really hurting us. Um, one of the things I ran on in 2018, that's really actually a personal thing for me is um, fighting against brain drain here in Michigan. Um, Michigan stands to lose a congressional seat because we continue to lose population over time. And um, a big thing that we're missing out on is uh, retaining our talent. And one of the things that, you know, when for better or for worse, when Amazon decided they did not want to choose Michigan as one of their headquarters locations um, and our Michigan bid was rejected in one of the first couple of rounds of bids, 
uh, one of the big things they cited was the lack of um, public transportation in the metro Detroit area. And so, you know, we don't just need Amazon to tell us that we need uh, rapid transit in the metro Detroit area. We know that that's a huge detraction for people staying, um, you know, staying in Detroit and staying in the metro Detroit area. And it's my hope that if we take majority, we're able to, to do something about that. I want to talk a little bit about that brain drain, because obviously you were in D.C. and New York working in international affairs. You decided to return home. What's your pitch to people who may be in those cities or other coastal cities to to come back to their states and, and get involved in state or local politics? Yeah, I mean, like... Anybody who, first of all, anybody who meets me knows, like, I, I won't shut up about Michigan. Like, it's just one of the coolest places to grow up. Um, we have, like, I always talk about Michigan sort of as, like, the mini laboratory for the entire United States. And if, you know, something is going on in Michigan, chances are within the next, like, year and a half or two years, you'll see it happening nationally. So, uh, and for better or for worse, that's the case, right? So, before the financial crisis of 2008, we were seeing an economic downturn in Michigan. Um, and so, that was sort of, you could tell where the winds were blowing. Um, and, but on the positive side of things, in Michigan, we have the strictest uh, legislation legislation in place at the state level regarding our drinking water. And that came as a result of the Flint water crisis. And so our legislation in Michigan for water testing is um, just a model that we can use in other states to um, help move things forward. And so I guess my, my biggest thing that I will say is, um, yeah, I'm like an obnoxious champion for the state of Michigan uh, when I talk to my friends who are from out of state as to why they should move here. Um, and I think I've done really well. A few of them are now pursuing higher education at the University of Michigan. And although I'm a Spartan, I won't hold that against them. Um, but, you know, I just really think that, um, you know, for folks to who really want to make that difference and are considering running for um, a state legislature position. Um, we, you know, in these uh, Midwestern states and in places where they, you know, folks grew up, whether it's the Midwest or the South, like it's really, really important that we have um, really strong voices for the people in these areas. And, um, you know, I would strongly urge people to consider moving home. If there's not a paid position for being uh, Mich Michigan's promoter in chief, uh, what, what, what do you see as your future? Are you interested in high, higher statewide office, national office? What, what, what are you thinking about? I am, well, at this point, I'm dead set focused on taking the majority of the Michigan house. Um, without that, um, frankly, nothing else matters at this point. Um, I really want to make sure that we are in the majority because, A, we've got a really great governor in Gretchen Whitmer. She's done a fantastic job in leading us through this pandemic. But, um, you know, without delivering the Michigan House, without delivering a W, um, you know, we're going to be in a really, really tough spot the next couple of years here um, in trying to climb out of, um, you know, the crisis that we have on our hands. And, of course, um, you know, we, I would never wish this pandemic on um, any, you know, future generation down the line. But the one thing that this pandemic has really done is it's really exposed um, some of the big challenges, systemic challenges that we have in our society today, whether it's, um, you know, sort of that unconscious bias in our healthcare system that has led, um, you know, people of color to really be predisposed to experiencing the worst of the pandemic. Um, to, you know, some serious uh, racial bias in our um, criminal justice system. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm just absolutely dead focused on making sure we take the Michigan House because I think there's a lot of really good opportunities for us to set the state on a great path for the next decade. I like it. And I like the idea of Michigan being a trendsetter. If, those, if you can start to chip away at those issues uh, and it can be a model for the rest of us. Um, it could make, it could have a big national impact very quickly. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for this conversation. Um, I think you're an inspiration to so many people who are looking at how to engage. Um, and I'm glad that the party has uh, recognized you and, and giving you a national stage to tell your story and inspire uh, little girls in and outside of Michigan uh, to run for office. <laughs> It's uh, just been such an incredible opportunity and what a humbling experience. I 
you know, I will say this too, for all of your listeners who are fellow introverts, it's been, um, it takes a lot of energy to be, uh, to put on that extroverted face and do this kind of work, but it is so worth it and so rewarding. And, you know, what a humbling experience and an honor it is to, um, you know, really get to be that voice and that champion for the people of this district and of our state. Well, you've done a great job uh, so far. And, I can't wait to see what you could do uh, with, again, knock on wood, a majority uh, in the legislature. Absolutely. I'm really, really excited. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And uh, we look forward to following your exploits uh, around the country uh, as you as you lead your state forward. Oh, the pleasure was all mine. Really, really happy to be here. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more Amazing Leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.